hell, or holy grail, from which Christ is said to have drunk at the Last Supper. This idea seems to be captured in this depiction of the grail by Dante Gabriel Rossetti. Rossetti was a 19th century esoteric painter who is said to have influenced modern Rosicrucianism. He may well have been familiar with the ancient legend since his grail cup appears to be a dark emerald green mounted in a golden frame. But according to the various legends that are told, this stone of Lucifer was divided into different parts. One part became the grail chalice, while King Solomon is said to have fashioned another part into a ring. Yet another part became the stone of the Kaaba. While this stone is black, Manley Hall suggests that Islam venerates the color green because of its association with the grail stone. Others believe the grail stone is the same as the emerald tablet. A depiction of this tablet can be found in the floor mosaic of the Cathedral of Siena, next to an image of Hermes Trismegistus, or Hermes Thrice Great. As such, it is known as the Emerald Tablet of Hermes. Written upon it is the Hermetic Maxim, that which is below is like that which is above. The tablet is also called the Philosopher's Stone, and is well known in the ancient world. Sir Isaac Newton even did his own transcription of the Emerald Tablet. In the modern world, Carl Jung is said to have had dreams of the Emerald Tablet. Manley Hall obviously knew about it and even published his own illustration. Hall writes that the oldest and most revered of all the alchemical formulae is the sacred Emerald Tablet of Hermes. In her book on the Merovingian mythos, occult author Tracy Twyman writes that the story of the Emerald Tablet of Hermes appears to be yet another incarnation of the Grail as stone. She goes on to say, the legend connected to these items and the stone they came from relate that the stone bounced off Cain's head as it fell to earth leaving a scar on his forehead in the shape of a red serpent, the mark of Cain. This is what the grail as stone represents. Meanwhile, Nicholas Rorick called his stone a Chintamani, an example of which is shown in this image of a Buddhist figure who holds a greenish Chintamani stone in his hand. While the legends of these stones vary and researchers often disagree, it is curious that both Rorick and Manley Hall use the same variant spelling of Eschenbach's term for the grail stone. Eschenbach uh, uh, wrote Lapsit Exilis rather than Lapis Exilis. In each of their writings, both Rorick and Hall use the term Lapis Exilis. This might be written off as mere coincidence, if not for the fact that Hall was meeting with Rorick in the upper penthouse of the master building. This suggests that they had the same understanding of the stone. Furthermore, both men were involved, along with Henry Wallace, in the theosophical teachings of Madame H. P. Blavatsky, who openly asserted the ancient Gnostic belief that the true God is Lucifer. As such, for Rorick to have a piece of Lucifer's gemstone would have had great significance. Dr. Obadiah Harris explained to us the importance of Madame Blavatsky to Manley Hall and to his writings about the founding and destiny of America. There's another important lady over here that um Mr. Hall wanted to honor, and that is Helen Blavatsky, a Russian woman. By the way, her little house in Russia, and I understand now, is the National Museum. But in the early days, uh, he wanted to pay tribute to her contribution, and she was the co-founder 
of the Theosophical Society, whose headquarters now is in is in India. Um, she she wrote Isis Unveiled, um, the Secret Doctrine, and it is said I don't know if this is true, but it, you know, she she died in 1891. Manny Hall was born in 1901, but it is said that he had read The Secret Doctrine by the time he was 12 years old and understood it. So there's a, a, a feeling that Manny Hall had a, had a bond with this woman, a kind of spiritual bond, and that when he wrote Secret Teachings of America, he was really writing the next book for her secret teaching, secret doctrine, that he was taking it farther, and he did. So he, he felt that in her was a kind of something of the isthmus of the spirit that, that gave birth to the Philosophical Research Society. If what Dr. Harris says is true, then Hall founded his entire society on the Luciferian doctrines of Madame H.P. Blavatsky. Manny Hall, of course, really was one of the leaders of this whole world esoteric movement for, you know, for probably 70 years or more. And he wrote extensively about the, the ancient mysteries, and he eventually joined the Masons and first moved up very rapidly to 33rd degree Mason, and then to the upper levels of Masonry, which are truly into the Luciferian, which most Masons have no idea even exists. In his writings, Hall said that when the Mason learns the mystery of his craft, the seething energies of Lucifer are in his hands. This quote comes from the book, The Lost Keys of Freemasonry, that was first published in 1923, the same year the casket had been delivered to the Roricks in Paris. The Luciferian Freemasonry described by Hall could very well have been known by such Masons as Henry Wallace and FDR especially if FDR was so familiar with Hall that he sent emissaries to Hall's library. Also consider that FDR's successor, Harry Truman, a fellow Mason, had Hall's books on his shelves. And certainly, Manley Hall's view of Lapis Exilis as the gemstone of Lucifer would not likely have escaped the attention of Nicholas Rorick. Despite Rorick's international mystique and influence in the Oval Office, he eventually suffered a sudden and sharp decline. While searching for seeds and grasses for the Department of Agriculture, he was also heavily involved with the politics of Central Asia. Buff Perry believes that prior to his fall, Rorick was working to amalgamate the countries of Asia into a united Buddhist theocracy that would ultimately be joined to a one-world government. In Nicholas Rorick's efforts to bring about an amalgamated, if you will, theocratic Buddhist nation that would have consisted of Manchuria, Mongolia, Tibet, part of China, perhaps part of India, perhaps some of Siberia, uh, he, he was working with the Tashi Lama who was uh, suspected by China, particularly, and to this day very much suspected by China, um, you know, as being uh, subversive to the stability of the region. And as a result of this, uh, Rorick became associated with, with accusations of, uh, of uh, espionage. Perry's further suspicion is that, at least for a time, Rorick's political efforts were on behalf of FDR's New Deal administration. We recorded the following conversation with Perry in December of 2008. So we've got the, the uh, uh, what nobody's talking about right now in American media, the North American Union, right, through the free right. agreement. The European Union, which is known about, but we never hear about it on the news. Right. And now there's an 
this Asian Union, it seems like Rorik was being used by the American government to lay the foundation for or to bring about an Asian Union. You got it. That I, I accept wholeheartedly. And I, and I think it's it, it, when you read it, the details, factual details, it, it, it's inescapable that America saw in Rorik the, 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 the capability of creating this great Asian Union. And he was supported by American intelligence. Rorik was supported when he was trying to bring together that great new nation. He, who was he reporting to? He was reporting to the, the American consulates in China. The official story seems to be that once Rorik was accused of being a spy, he fell out of favor with his two greatest supporters, Henry Wallace and Louis Horch. But what about Rorik's so-called Stone of Destiny, this holy grail that he claimed was in his possession, supposedly buried inside the cornerstone of the master building? Whether the stone or some part of it is there or not, Buff Perry has come to the conclusion that Rorik's artifact was a cunningly devised fable. Just for our audience, just you don't buy into the idea of the mystical, magical nature of this stone. Absolutely not. And and you think it was a, a showpiece uh, fabricated by the Roricks, really to beguile guys like Henry Wallace, it seems like. Yes. I do. I, d I do. When we first interviewed Buff several years ago, he seemed to have the impression that the Stone of Destiny was the same stone that Rorik had in his possession. Today, he believes they are not at all the same thing, and that perhaps this is what caused Wallace to become disillusioned with his guru. I think Wallace uh, felt perhaps deceived when he's anticipating the arrival of what he called the Stone of Destiny in correspondence uh, and then ends up with, you know, nothing in effect. Nevertheless, Perry still believes that Jacob's Pillow Stone, which is said to be the real Stone of Destiny, was brought to America by the Jacobites and may have been recovered by the French-Canadian explorer La Verandry in the 1700s. The, the La Verandry Stone is, a, you know, clearly has some association with the Stone of Destiny. But the whereabouts of the stone today are still unknown. As a Jewish researcher, the real stone holds special significance for Buff Perry. According to the Jewish belief, the pillow stone of Jacob is one of the original artifacts that was kept in King Solomon's temple in Jerusalem. The stone variously called the Stone of Destiny, Foundation Stone, Pillow Stone of Jacob, and other titles is expected and is necessary uh, to be in Jerusalem for the final construction of the final temple. The Jews believe that that temple, and not all Jews, but most of the Jews today, active in rabbinical orders that are preparing to you know, conduct all the rituals in the final temple as we speak, um, believe that all articles that were in Solomon's temple have to be returned if they're known to exist. If they're not known to exist, then it's a different matter. But all those that are known to exist must be returned and would then go into use again in the final temple. Buff believes that Nicholas and Helena Rorick aligned their Chintamani stone with the Stone of Destiny in order to sensationalize their own cause. But others continue to believe that Rorick's stone was from the stars and had real power. The Rorick's themselves were known for tapping into the supernatural realm. Uh, the Rorick's were particularly eccentric. Helena Rorick spent much of her lifetime channeling a spirit that called itself Master Mariah, the same spirit that inspired Madame Blavatsky to declare that Lucifer was God. We told you earlier about the letter from Zena Fosdick that describes the contents of the Rajput casket
placed inside the cornerstone of the master building. But we neglected to mention a few of the items that Buff Perry 